Hey, my name is Matt Storr and I repair saxophones for a living. Uh, today I would like to talk to you about the Powell Silver Eagle. Um, this is one of 18 of them ever made. This is number 10. And the Powell Silver Eagle was a project to make a professional saxophone handmade in the United States in the modern era. Um, and only 18 were ever made because the project never fully made it off the ground, uh, although they did get some instruments built, and this one plays fantastically. Um, uh, I was lucky enough to be able to fully repad this last year. A friend of mine bought it and just figured if he's going to go crazy and buy a Powell Silver Eagle, might as well go whole hog and have me repad it as well, uh, so it's set up more like the rest of his horns. So I actually got to get pretty deep inside this, which is unusual for me to do on a new horn. You know, people don't usually buy a new saxophone and then give it to me to overhaul, um, although it has happened. And the fact that it was a Powell Silver Eagle was just, you know, what a treat to get to work on. Um, something so special and so unique. But it's, it's rather unusual for me to talk about a modern saxophone, especially, you know, not just because I don't get to take them apart all the time, but because, you know, people that I know worked on this um, and a lot of blood sweat and tears was put into this project um, and it's probably still a little bit sore uh, you know for some of the people that that worked on this and I know that you know the they weren't done working on it they weren't done making it you know so to to judge this instrument as like a you know production instrument isn't really correct so it should be noted that what we're looking at, although this was an instrument that was built and sold, um, this is really a prototype. Um, they had gotten pretty far. They'd gotten a sellable instrument. They got an instrument that's playable. But this was not their eventual goal. Um, and the main thing about it that's not their eventual goal was the key work. So when they made this instrument, they, as far as I know, and, and again, you know, there's people out there that actually worked on this, so... Uh, consider my information with a grain of salt, because I wasn't there. But as far as I know, the body tube is actually based upon uh, schematics for a King Super 20. So the body tube should be identical or extremely close to a King Super 20. And in playing, you know, I've got a lot of Super 20s sitting right here because I just did a Super 20 video, and I'm A-B-ing this back and forth. It plays very, 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 very much like a Super 20. I mean, it's, it's hard to really know if there's a difference um, between them, if I'm just playing them differently, if I'm, you know, it, they basically sound the same to me. Um, but they feel different under the fingers because the key work is based on BNS tooling and actually BNS parts. So BNS was a saxophone maker in Germany that recently stopped making saxophones. And if you own a BNS, you may notice a lot of these shapes looking like the ones on your BNS. And that's because when you look at a saxophone key, okay, you've got the pad cup is a discrete piece, this arm is a discrete piece, this hinge tube is a discrete piece, and then the arm here, and then the spatula, and then the steel, and then the roller, right? So someone has to take all those pieces, put them on a jig that holds them in place, and then braze them together, right? So Powell, which is a flute maker based in Boston, um, in a partnership with E.K. Blessing and Elkhart, got all these parts and got all this tooling, all the jigs and so forth, for the BNS instruments. And they're taking BNS keywork, BNS parts, and manufacturing it in such a way that it fits on a completely different body tube, with tone holes that are in a slightly different locations. Um, uh, you know, and, and it's kind of difficult to adapt that. And they did a pretty good job, but you can see in a lot of places uh, where they hadn't quite finished the job. And I know that their eventual goal was to make their own keys, you know, to use the tooling that they'd gotten to make their own keys rather than take BNS keys and adapt them. But you'll see places like they wanted to make the King Super 20 style um, adjustable pivot screws. And you've got them on the top here, but not on the bottom of those same keys, which is kind of unusual. And you'll also see I'm using like a block to hold this up because the left hand pinky table um, sticks out really far. It's not, it's actually not super comfortable to hit B flat. You really got to go pretty far to do that. Um, and you can see it looks kind of unusual there. 
So it doesn't fit in every case, and I can't even lay it on the table because it rests on that, which is not a very solid place to rest. Um, from a playing perspective, other than that left hand pinky table, it's a very comfortable horn. It feels pretty good under the fingers. Um, from a repairing perspective, it's a bit more obvious that we're sort of in prototype territory here. Um, it's rather unusual to see like a long rod like this that has your G uh, and your G sharp on it in modern times. They did take the bis and move it back onto a pivot screw here. But most modern saxophones have a short stack about that long where you've got your C sharp, B, and A. And then your bis and your G are on individual pivots. And then your G sharp usually comes over here. So kind of unusual uh, setup for the instrument, but that's an artifact of the fact that they were using BNS tooling. Um, one thing they did that's really cool is that they braze the tone holes just like on a Super 20, right? So I've actually got a Super 20 sitting here. So here's a Super 20, right? And you can see the influence. Um, and let me move this back so we can lay them side by side. So the tone holes on Super 20s are brazed. They're separate pieces of, of brass that are then brazed to the body, also called silver soldering or hard soldering, um, rather than being pieces of the body that are pulled up to form the tone holes. And they're brazed rather than soft soldered. Soft solder is how you attach post to the body. But that's a fairly weak, not, I mean not fairly weak, it is a comparatively weak joint and it also breaks down over time, whereas silver soldering or brazing really doesn't break down over time and it's as strong as the surrounding metal. But it's also extremely time intensive um, uh, and you know, uh, labor intensive and time consuming. And that's where Powell comes in. So Powell's a flute maker in Boston and they make handmade flutes where they uh, solder the tone holes onto the body. So they had the expertise to make soldered tone holes, which no one really has anymore. Um, so they made tone holes and brazed them onto the body. And on this particular model, this is kind of the top of the line silver eagle with the silver neck, the silver bell, and all these tone holes are sterling silver too. I don't know if you can see that, um, the difference in color to the body. Now, you know, what does that do tonally? I don't know. You know, I'm not really sure it does much of anything. I mean, there's probably other things in the horn that make a bigger difference than having silver tone holes, but that is just super cool. And that's a level of craftsmanship that, you know, we haven't seen on an American-made saxophone since the Super 20. Um, so that was really cool to see. And the body tube uh, and the tone holes are pretty well made. Um, I had to do a little bit of leveling on some of these, um, which I was obviously very careful about, but we were trying to make this instrument as good as it possibly could be, so I had to get the tone holes level. Um, but they were pretty darn level to start with, which is impressive. The body tube is nice and straight. Um, and given the constraints of working with the key work they had, um, they came up with a really good product. And I wish that we could have seen what would have happened if they were able to continue development and start making their own key work to match the body. You can also see it's got a kind of inter interesting uh, bell-to-body brace there. The engraving is really cool, um, you know, done in the U.S. by a uh, U.S. engraver, Powell Silver Eagle. Um, yeah, so that's the Silver Eagle, and uh, this is something that, you know, could have been more, but I'm just excited that it happened at all, that we got to see it, and, you know, I think... I hope, you know, it's difficult for someone in my position. I obviously am biased and I obviously care a lot about this stuff when a lot of people really don't. You know, even people who play saxophone don't care too much about the actual instruments themselves a lot. Instruments themselves a lot. But I, I, I do feel like eventually we're going to see uh, an American made professional saxophone, truly American made, not just assembled here or tweaked here or overhauled here, but made in Taiwan or China, but actually made here. And that's what this is. This wasn't made in China. This wasn't assembled here. This was made here by American workers doing something in Elkhart that they hadn't done in decades. Um, and they did a pretty darn good job. So uh, that's the Powell Silver Eagle. There's 18 of them that exist. This is number 10. Um, and uh, I think this is one of only maybe four or five of them 
uh, or the full deal with the silver tone holes because uh, that was the most expensive option by far. Um, but uh, there you have it, the Powell Silver Eagle. And if you worked on this project and uh, you know, you're watching this, my apologies if I got anything wrong. Uh, please feel free to correct me. And uh, you know, great job, guys. I, I wish I wish we'd seen more.